Iron 6 Maiden Flight, what went well and what did not, a short update of Starbase activities, the launches of the week with many disappointments, and a crew of four have simulated Martian Live for over a year. I'm Christophe Paget for All About Space, and this is your Space News Update. After long delays and many tests later, Ariane Group finally launched his new rocket Ariane 6. Ariane 6 was designed to replace Ariane 5 with a reduced price tag to compete with SpaceX and New Glenn and ensure European sovereignty in terms of satellite launches. Ariane 6 is coming with two or four side boosters and with a small or large fairings. The first stage has one engine, the Vulcan 2.1, a modified version of Ariane 5's Vulcan 2, Ion 6 is capable of sending 10.3 metric tons to low Earth orbit in two booster configuration, whilst with four side boosters, Ion 6 is capable of delivering payloads of 21.6 metric tons to low Earth orbit or 5 metric tons to geostationary orbit, an increase by 6 to 8 percent compared to Ion 5's capability. The flight started under a bright sunshine at the European spaceport in Kourou, French Guiana with a perfect takeoff powered by his two P120 solid side boosters and the Vulcan 2.1 of the first stage, up to an altitude of about 100 kilometers, at which point the side boosters detached from the first stage, shortly followed by fairing separation. And the first stage then continued up to 270 kilometer altitude to finally separate and land in the Atlantic Ocean. The upper stage carried out to an altitude of 575 km to successfully relight its Vinci engine twice. And the upper stage then started delivering its payload to an altitude of 585 km, which is an hour and six minutes in the launch. And finally, the last payload released at 600 km altitude or two hours, 40 minutes in the launch. That was the profile of a typical mission to most rocket customers expect from a rocket. However, ESA and Iron Group designed the upper stage to be relit multiple times, so uh, to allow multiple orbit deliveries, but also to deorbit the upper stage and get rid of it during atmospheric re-entry, therefore minimizing the debris in orbit. However, at the third relight of the Vinci engine, the Auxiliary Propulsion Unit, or APU, did not start. This unit repressurizes the tanks to ensure the propellant remains at the bottom of the tank to ensure the Vinci engine works nominally. As a result, the safety feature did not allow the Vinci to relight and the upper stage is now going to burn up in the atmosphere in a matter of years after natural orbital decay instead of hours as planned. Nix and Iron Group had two payloads still attached to be released on that last leg of the journey to study the material ability to survive re-entry. To ensure no more debris is left in space, CNES did not release these payloads, making unhappy customers. The Iron 6 team has mentioned in a press conference that the last part of the launch is not going to stop or delay the launch of the next flights, which one will happen in Q4 of 2024 and six others in 25. A great job done by Iron 6 team and more to come later this year and the next. At Starbase this week, booster number 12 has left the production site and rolled out to the launch site and placed onto the launch mount to start its test campaign. The first of which was a cryogenic test, one of the tests required for the upcoming integral flight test number five and by the way, Elon has recently mentioned that Flight 5 would occur in one month, which was exactly what he mentioned a month ago, meaning this time early August 2024 launch. I wouldn't book your flight just yet if you plan to go and witness such a launch, as the date might be further delayed. Staying at the launch site, the first section of the Mekazila Tower Number 2 has been placed on top of his newly built tower base, Pretty much the same as last week was happening across the rest of the site. NASA independent body, the GOA or Government Accountability Office, has reviewed the HLS part of Artemis 3 quite some time ago, 
but the information took a number of months to funnel through. Now, they concluded that SpaceX will inevitably be late in delivering its human landing system during the parallel flight of SLS for this Artemis 3 mission planned in September 2026. They mentioned that the SpaceX plan is unrealistic and explained that there is a 70% chance for SpaceX to deliver at best in February 2028 or otherwise much later. Firefly has been contracted to launch a NASA payload within 24 hours of contract award. It was an Alpha rocket launched from California for the mission Noise of Summer. The launch occurred on July 4th, around 96 hours from contract award. The rocket was ready to launch within 24 hours, to be fair, from that contract award, but suffered from a scrub due to a faulty ground support equipment connection, which was quickly fixed. Well done, nonetheless, to Firefly for such an achievement. CASC then sent on the same day his Long March 6A from China for his mission Tuanwei 502A and B. July 8th, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 from Florida for his mission Turksat 6A. The first stage flew for his 15th time and landed on a drone ship. July 9th, Kness successfully launched his maiden flight of Ion 6 from French Guiana, as previously mentioned. And July 11th, iSpace launched his Hyperbola 1 from China for his mission Xiguang 1. Sadly, the rocket fourth stage malfunctioned and the payload was lost. The last launch of this week was the SpaceX Falcon 9 from California for a Starlink mission called Group 93. The first stage landed on a drone ship for its 19th time. For the second stage, unfortunately, the engine suffered the same fate as Ion 6 demo phase and Hyperbola 1 and did not complete his second burn. As a result, the Starlink satellites were deployed into a lower than intended orbit and SpaceX is trying to contact these satellites and raise their orbit with their onboard ion thrusters, but it will inevitably shorten the satellite's life. In summary, this week, two American rocket launches out of three were successful, bringing to 84 the total number of successful American rockets. One Chinese rocket out of two was also successful, bringing the tally of successful Chinese rockets to 30. And one European rocket was successfully launched, bringing the total to two now. Would you stay indoors for one year with no visitors, nor going out to the pictures or restaurants? Well, a crazy team of four people have done just that. Why? Well, to the name of science and in preparation for occupying Mars. Indeed, NASA is starting three studies each one year long to understand the human capacity to live in isolation with little of many things and none of the rest. Now, the least of what this group has been deprived of is very long. And yet, they did it. What an achievement. This was not a Big Brothers watching you or a reality TV show. It really happened. 378 days isolated in a compound made of 3D printed house similar to what NASA expect to build with inside resource once they have a vehicle to transport to Mars, equipments and crew. June 25, 2023, the team entered the 1700 square foot enclosure. It was composed of Nathan Jones, Anka Celario, Kelly Haston and Ross Brockwell. Nathan Jones was the crew medical officer and used his emergency and international medicine experience to tackle the unique challenges of the Mars mission. Anka Celario brought expertise as a microbiologist in the US Navy with a background in viral vaccine discovery, prion transmission, gene therapy development, and infectious disease research management. Kelly Haston, the mission commander, is a research scientist who builds human disease models. She has spearhead innovative stem cells based project deriving multiple cell types for work in infertility, liver disease and neurodegeneration. Her role was pivotal in maintaining crew morale and ensuring the success of daily operations. Ross Brockwell, the mission's flight engineer, focused on infrastructure, building design and organizational leadership. 
The structural engineering background influences his approach to problem solving in the habitat. I leave you with this amazing space shape, the planetary nebula Jones Amberson 1. This is the result of a dying sun like star situated some 1600 light years from Earth or 15 quadrillion kilometer or 0.9 quadrillion miles towards the constellation Lynx. About four light years across, the center of the planetary nebula is what remains of the stellar core, a blue hot white dwarf star, also known as PK164 plus 31.1. The nebula is faint and very difficult to glimpse at a telescope's eyepiece, but this deep image, combining over 12 hours of exposure time, does show it off in exceptional detail. Jones Amberson's one will fade away over the next few thousand years, and his hot central white dwarf star will take billions of years to cool. You can also see in the background many stars and galaxies, some of which lie in our own Milky Way galaxy. That's it. This was your episode of All About Space. I'm Christophe Paget. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and have a great week.